Hello, everyone. Thanks for attending our watch party and panel discussion. We have a terrific evening planned, and I'm so glad that you're joining us. I'm Mark Morgan, faculty in the School of Natural Resources at Mizzou. Um, Eat Mo Carp is an initiative that I created to promote human consumption of Asian carp, really the menace of the Midwest. So tonight, we'll learn more about this issue and some possible solutions by watching a short movie and then in interacting with a panel of experts. My son filmed and edited this video production. Way to go, John. Now, let me briefly introduce our panelists. Brady Deaton is the former chancellor and director of an Institute for International Development that addresses world hunger. Andrew Clark is a faculty member in food science at MU. Kevin Rose is from Convoy of Hope, an international relief and development organization located in Springfield, Missouri. Quentin Phelps is a fishery biologist at Missouri State University, who's an authority on Asian carp. Roy Source is, of Source Freshwater is a carp processing facility in Peoria, Illinois. Clint Carter, who is a, a commercial fisher, is actually fishing at this moment, and he's trying to get on <laughs> the panel discussion. And so uh, we'll see if he's going to make it or not. If it will, if he if he can come, it'll be through a cell phone. And then lastly, my graduate student, Cynthia Santosa from Indonesia is assisting with this event as well. Be ready to ask some questions after the video. My name is Mark Morgan. I'm an associate professor in the School of Natural Resources at the University of Missouri. My teaching and research interests deal with human dimensions of natural resource management. And what that really means is people's interaction with the natural environment, the outdoors. So what we have is management problems typically occur where there's a problem with the environment, there's also a problem with people, and so we try to manage these situations together. So carp are an invasive species, we need to do something about it, it becomes a management problem. But it also is a social problem, they're overpopulating the Mississippi River Basin and all its tributaries. So they're hurting the native species, the native fish, and they're also threatening to get in the Great Lakes, which could kind of disrupt the multi-billion dollar commercial and recreational fishing industry. So there's a huge problem, there's a lot at stake, and we're looking for potential solutions, but we haven't come up with a lot of those at this point in time. Markets for Asian carp here in Illinois, in the Midwest, do exist, but we need some help. Uh, things for like human consumption, uh, fish fertilizers, animal feeds, fish meal, fish oil are all there, but need to grow. Asian carp have been consumed for long periods of time. This is a healthy fish, right? Light, white, flaky meat is delicious. Um, high in omega-3s, omega-6s. I mean, this is a valuable protein that's feeding uh, the world. Over the last five years, I've done a lot of taste tests using carp, and I've given it to grocery stores, I've given it to restaurants, we've done a lot of feeding events across the state. And literally, I fed Asian carp to thousands of Missourians, and they really love the taste of it. And I thought, well, if Missourians like the taste of carp so well, then people in developing countries would like it even more. And so therefore, that encouraged me to think in terms of processing it in a different way. My name is uh, Idalbert uh, Joseph and founder of Glow House Services for People in Haiti. Okay, sending fish to, uh, to Haiti is a great idea because those people go hungry all the time. The fish go to help. They are very poor in Haiti. So the Northwest part, for example, they're eating, like uh, buying a sweet potato or a green banana with eggs some of them that's enough for the whole day for them. Most of them, they love fishing when they go to the sea. The family go and fishing there, they love fish. Uh, yeah, the protein is very important. We need to teach them about the health situation, the food they're eating, what kind of food they have to eat to, get it, to have a good protein. Protein is probably the greatest source of need in the country. They have other sources of protein, but not animal-based sources of protein. There's actually multiple benefits of using carp as a hunger relief strategy. One, it's uh, very cheap. It's a very inexpensive uh, food source. Second is a great source of protein. Third, it's high in omega-3 fatty acids. And then it's very low in contaminants. So therefore, it really becomes a win-win. What we can do is rid our, or help to rid our water systems, big river systems, of the Asian carp, and then we can process and package the fish in a way that doesn't require refrigeration or freezing, send it to Haiti to assist with their humanitarian efforts. 
My name's Clint Carter. I run our family business, Carter's Fish Market. I'm a commercial fisherman, and I'm a big advocate for using this invasive Asian carp. The, the Asian carp were brought in the 70s from China to the United States to clean up the water and to raise in aquaculture with fish farmers. So that's where they began. Then our floods, they released into the Mississippi River Basin then spread widely throughout. They get too large for other fish to eat. You know, a 20 pound fish, there's nothing out, there's no natural predators out there besides us. If you don't have a, a harvest, you will not balance the ecosystem. Carp are a big problem, and they are increasing in numbers throughout the United States. Our average fishing trip, we land between four and 7,000 pounds. The silver carp are at, valued at 10 cents a pound. We need to get the value up because it costs a lot of money for the boat, trucks, and nets and equipment licensing and everything else. If you're familiar with some of the ecological writings in the 60s, Rachel Carson wrote a book called Silent Spring, talking about we're putting all these toxins in the water, we're creating a problem, which led to solutions. Uh, scientists start thinking, are there biological controls we can use in ponds and places, things that will eat nuisance aquatic vegetation? Let's bring over the grass carpet in 1960. What about the plankton blooms and things like that that happen when you feed channel catfish in an aquaculture environment? Well, let's bring over a big head carp or silver carp as early as 1974 to help cleaning the water. So these things were brought over to actually help us in the aquaculture environment when these fish quickly got out. And in the middle of 1970s already, we have big head and silver carp out in the environment and really moving throughout the Mississippi River. We often get asked how many fish are out there in, in the Illinois River, in the Mississippi River, in the Missouri River. That number is really impossible. There's a lot. Asian carp are a threat to our native fish. We think there's probably 20 to 50 million pounds available for harvest annually, um, and that won't get rid of them. This project addresses a very important environmental issue at home, which is reduction of invasive species into our big river systems. While providing for the needs of people that live in undeveloped countries, such as Haiti, because their biggest need is a source of protein. What we consider to be trash becomes somebody else's treasure. I think this is a creative solution to an environmental problem because it involves people and natural resources. My name is Megan Wheeler and I'm a fisheries and wildlife science major here at the University of Missouri. The McNair Scholars Program is a year-long competitive program aimed at getting undergraduate students interested and participating in their own research projects. I chose to do my research project on preserving Asian carp for use as a food resource in third world nations. This project aims to provide people in developing nations with a source of food, healthy food, while reducing the population of Asian carp here in the U.S., but not increasing the consumer's risk of health issues. I first became interested in carp when I volunteered with Dr. Morgan for his Eat Mo Carp program at a Bass Pro event. That program works on trying to get people interested and aware of the idea of eating carp as part of a way of controlling their populations, which I thought, thought was very interesting. My role in this project uh, involves providing some technical assistance and helping to work out the details on the drying and salting and basically the preservation of the, uh, of the carp. We're using a meat smoker in our process because it provides a more uh, uniform set of conditions for accomplishing the dehydration process. Asian carp has not had a historically desired image here in the United States. Since it was an invasive species, it has a negative connotation. It's not necessarily uh, normal for uh, local uh, people to go out and harvest the product and make use of it. And yet Asian carp is very popular in other portions of the world. Just feeding the population is not the only thing that's beneficial. I think there's probably some goodwill involved. If we can find an alternative use for the Asian carp so that we can depopulate them locally where we don't particularly care for them in order to make them available in other parts of the world, uh, we think that that could be a beneficial uh, situation as well. It's certainly a, a concept of using salted and dried food to alleviate the concerns about um, refrigeration and the electrical systems that are necessary for those kind of conditions. For our purposes is to look at the right combination of salts, dehydration, and some packaging in order to properly preserve the fish longest possible time for the, for the consumer, and yet also keep the cost as minimal as possible. Convoy Hope started in 1994, 
And we really started with a desire to serve communities and help meet needs, uh, both in areas of disasters as well as community events. Started in California, then we got transplanted here to Missouri. This is a good central location. So we're everywhere from the Philippines and Asia to we're working in uh, three, to, three to four different countries in Africa, from Kenya, Tanzania, Ethiopia, to our part of the world, we're working in Haiti, uh, Nicaragua, El Salvador. Our main focus is helping meet nutritional needs because uh, we believe that that's an important building block to a community. Uh, when it comes to animal-based protein, it's definitely something we're always looking for more of. When we initially made contact with Dr. Morgan in 2015 and heard the original concept around the CART project, we were obviously very intrigued from the protein piece of it, but as well as being Missouri-based, being aware of the problem that existed with the carp uh, infiltration here in the U.S., we just felt that this is an incredible potential partnership. The current carp that we're looking at sending right now, we're sending to the country of Haiti. Uh, Haiti, for us, we feed over 90,000 kids there every school day, so we're excited to add this product uh, offerings there to the kids. Uh, we're excited to also look at this as a feasibility study to see how can we do more of this types of things and continue to work with Dr. Morgan on seeing how we can explore to grow and get this to more countries even beyond Haiti. For this project, we're super excited because it's going to add a, um, you know, a, a different tool to our toolbox of what we offer to kids through adding more protein, so we see that that's going to that's going to impact their nutritional health, which is going to affect their ability to come to school more consistently, which is going to affect the long-term impact of that community and ultimately the country. Yeah, they love their fish. Yeah, they like it. Well, that was our first trial at uh, serving Asian carp to Haitians. Uh, I did it with the kids on purpose. Uh, they loved it. There's other problems that need creative solutions as well. Be thinking about what you can do to help the environment. Okay, that was our film tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. I imagine that it generated a few questions from the audience, and so that's what we want to do now is to have a little Q&A session with uh, the participants. And so if you would, there's a function at the bottom that's the Q&A button. Uh, and if you would press that and then just type your question into that box, then uh, we'll all be able to see that and then respond to that. If you want it directed to a particular person, then that's fine. But um, um, we'll, we'll, and if it's not directed, I'll probably direct it myself uh, to, a, to a particular individual. So if you would, go ahead and be thinking about questions now, uh, maybe writing them down. And if you're ready, then go ahead and put them in the chat box. And I mean, the Q&A box, sorry. And then uh, we'll kind of go from there. Okay, to get us started, uh, I've got a few questions myself. And then, uh, but I don't want to usurp um, your uh, role in this question making process. I strongly encourage you to ask some questions. So be thinking about what question you'd like to ask. But let me start with Quentin. Uh, Quentin, what do you, uh, what's the extent of the Asian carp problem in the United States? Can you just tell us that a little bit? Sure enough. So uh, we have, we have big issues in the Mississippi River. And of course, that's extending basically entire length of the Mississippi River system from, you know, Minnesota all the way down to the, to the Gulf of Mexico. And then up the Ohio River, <clears throat> um, all the way up to, to West Virginia, and then the Missouri River, all the way up into you know South Dakota and that area, and then all of the tributaries of, of all of those locations as well. So uh, this is, even though it's a big problem in the Midwest, it's a, it's a much bigger problem um, basically throughout the U.S. Uh, of course, the Mississippi River Basin, every, most all of those interconnected systems within that drainage are all impacted by Asian carp. So, and, and the one thing I'll say there is that um, 
the, the relative impact or the relative density and, and how they're influencing uh, various components of the uh, aquatic environment are, are going to vary just because the density varies, but they're having at they're they're in those locations so that they may be having an effect in, in all that entire area that I was just talking about. Oh, when you say effect, uh, what's the big issue here? Why why is Asian carp so, a problem? So so as as probably a lot of you know, they are they're a planktivore, which means that they're consuming the basin of our all of our aquatic food webs. So uh, zooplankton and phytoplankton are needed um, at various, well, at, at predominantly the early life stages for all of our native fishes that we have. And so the other issue with Asian carp is, is that they're very, very efficient at consuming that, that, that planktonic, uh, you know, that those planktonic nutrients out of the water. So essentially what's happening is, is that that base into the food web is being eliminated and by process of elimination, then um, all other levels of the food web, uh, particularly those above that are going to be influenced deleteriously. Right. So, so basically impact on native species. Right. And, 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 and Mark, I'll, I'll add this is that, you know, a lot of folks believe that, you know, Asian carp are this, horrific predator on, you know, other, you know, native fishes. And that's not really the case. The fact of the matter is that they're eating the food of other fishes. That's, that's what's stimulating the problem. Okay. We have a few questions now on the Q and a box. So that's good. Thank you for your participation. So this is from John. Um, and I think Quentin probably could answer this one as well. What makes the carp, uh, the Asian carp so prolific here in the United States? Do they have a special quality that allows them to readily adapt to uh, new environments? So, so we do a lot of work with uh, we we do a lot of folk work with with folks overseas in the in, in the Yangtze, and and so the environmental conditions in the Yangtze where this fish is native um, are very very similar to the conditions that we have in our big rivers uh, throughout the throughout the U.S. and so. The one, the one additional big problem that we have here is that we don't have a native predator that has the densities high enough to be able to control, uh, to control the populations that we have now. So uh, they're a highly fecund critter. They grow fast. Uh, they mature quickly. Um, <clears throat> and so you have these success, successful generations occurring very quickly in the system. And as a result, the population begins to expand because the vulnerability to predation by uh, many of our native species uh, just simply can't occur. So you basically, and, and now I'm exaggerating here, but, but essentially an Asian carp can hatch and then overnight it goes to something that's that's much bigger and, 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 and basically uh, allows them to evade predation. So, so that's why they're so darn successful. And as, as I just said that, you know, they're extremely fecund, very successful reproducing uh, in, in the conditions that we have in our big river systems in the U.S. because they're so very similar to where they're native. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, are there any concerns about bioaccumulation and the toxins in carp, <clears throat> for example, uh, mercury? Right. So again, you know, and, and I, I'm, I'm with Mark too. I think this is a, this is a great thing that we're doing here. And, and I think uh, the perfect place for, for folks to, uh, to try them is, is, is through this. Um, carp are, <clears throat> carp don't have a, a lot of the same problems that some of our big river fishes do in that, um, you know, because they're consuming the base into the food web, because they're growing so fastly, or growing so fast, they don't have the ability or, or, or the propensity uh, to bioaccumulate those toxin, heavy metals, PCBs, et cetera, like many of our longer lived, uh, slower growing, later maturing fishes in our big rivers. So, so, so no, it's, it's not, it's not the same. Okay, good. Okay, so the next question comes from Dylan. Um, what roadblocks uh, did you run into going through the process of fishing, harvesting, preservation of the carp? Um, 
and what solutions did you find and, and how'd you work around it? Um, maybe, uh, Andrew, if you could answer some of the other, the other second part of that, the preservation of the car, did we uh, run into any spe special problems with preservation? Okay, well, uh, I'm, I'm glad you're not asking me a big question about the harvesting part. That definitely is not, not, not my part of it. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, you, you saw them processing fish. Uh, you've, you've got to remove the heads, remove uh, the insides, the whole bit. Um, but basically that's processing fish. That's a common and usual practice. And so the, it's not particularly difficult to achieve that. Uh, in terms of the second part of the question, how did we work around things? Well, if the goal was sending some product to Haiti, we don't want to send fresh perishable fish. We didn't want to send it under refrigeration or frozen and so forth. So that's why we settled on the dried. And so dried and salted product was uh, deemed probably the most efficient and effective way for us to uh, prepare it here in order to ship it and be able to be consumed and distributed within the uh, within country. Uh, the second item that might come up about that is going, well, well how much salt did you use and other things? That's kind of where uh, Megan was working on finding a good formula, you know, do, how much salt do we need to achieve the uh, safety and preservation of the product? And so that was, a, she, she was a very effective worker on that uh, particular project. And I think we came up with a, 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 good, a good recipe. Okay, good, thank you. Um, since Clint is not here with us right this moment, uh, maybe Roy, if you could address a little bit of the fishing and the harvesting part of that, uh, even though- I'm you're... here. Oh, 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 Clint is here. Oh, whoa. Man. Yeah, I'm here. Jump in. <laughs> okay, great. Clint, welcome aboard. This is great. Okay, so uh, Clint, tell us a little bit about the roadblocks associated with fishing and harvesting uh, of the Asian carp. What, what kind of problems do you uh, uh, run into or encounter? The numerous problems, um, but a lot of it's market driven. Um, so we have to, if we're going out fishing, we have to take care of the fish and, and sell them, pay for our gas and the make a wage. So not having a, oh, uh, can you hear me still? Yeah, 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 uh, sure. So not, not, not having a reliable market don't give us the ability to build up the fishery um so we can we can harvest them all the time sorry and then can you tell us a little bit about the harvesting business itself like um uh, the nets and gas and other you know types of equipment and materials and supplies that you're going to need oh well clint may not he, he may have dropped Okay, uh, Roy, let's come back to you then. Uh, what, are there any special processing issues? Um, since you're, you're not a commercial fisher, but you certainly deal with fishermen and you deal with fish on a regular basis. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of this uh, maybe difficulty or roadblocks with uh, fishing and harvesting, uh, keeping it fresh, you know, that type of thing? Sure, um, we joined the program last year um, and met Mark and we, just, we helped uh, create uh, the Midwest Fish Co-op which prior to that, they were a very fractionalized group of fishermen that like Clinton mentioned, did not have a, uh, a good market to sell their product to on a consistent basis. That's where we stepped in, uh, met with the fishermen and created a, a central location in East Peoria, Illinois, where the, we take all the fish they bring in, all the different species, different sizes, and we find markets for those fish. Um, so it, it's, been a, it's been a challenge to accomplish that, but we finally have accomplished that. Uh, a good example is um, this week, we'll probably bring over 200,000 pounds of the fish in this week alone, which will be our single biggest week. Um, prior to that, we were averaging about 40 to 50,000 pounds. But as the commercial fishermen uh, became more comfortable and, uh, especially to put it, more um, understanding or the, what we're trying to achieve as a goal, they fished more often and they decide this is the best market for them to accomplish their needs of providing a equitable living for themselves and their families. Okay, good. Thanks, Roy. Can you tell us a little bit about some current and existing markets and maybe some future markets for the Asian carp? 
Currently, the Asian carp have a couple different markets. Um, one, uh, which is what I call the least desirable is a fertilizer um, or a fish meal type product. Uh, that's where the rendering parts go and other uh, parts of the fish uh, that aren't necessarily human grade. Uh, the other part, the other fish, uh, we've looked into markets and have markets created that are for, uh, not only for the bait industry, um, we'll take parts of these fish and use them for bait, but we're focused primarily on the human consumption part. Uh, we've made great inroads in that uh, arena and with the help of the fishermen and their understanding of the quality need of that product, meaning ice these fish down straight out of the water, uh, bring them to a location that's right near the, uh, the bodies of water they're catching them. We're able to increase the quality of those fish to a point where they um, are more desirable and they can be used for that human consumption. Uh, we're in the process of creating several different products besides our mince product. Um, we've also worked with Mark to create another product that uh, we're hopefully going to uh, uh, be shipping to Haiti one day. Um, isn't it true that some of the processors uh, uh, take the head off and the guts out and then send the product back to China? Yeah, uh, that is true. Some of them do that. Uh, we don't do that. We feel there's enough market in the U.S. Um, to sustain the volume in this, uh, in this area based on the current amount of fish these commercial fishermen can bring in. There's a definite need uh, um, for the food source, a high quality protein food source. And it's more of an educational process. The reason these fish are headed right now and gutted and sent overseas is because of that, uh, I'll call it lack of education for the US public to understand that these are a a very desirable clean fish um, that are uh, very surprisingly uh, healthy and good tasting at the same time. Okay, good. Thank you, Roy. Okay, so we have a question from Lindsay. Um, she asked, uh, how many fish have you sent to Haiti? Um, and actually, I guess I can answer that one because it's really a, just a test run to see how well this process would work. Uh, we sent about maybe three to probably about 300 pounds to Haiti through using Convoy of Hope. So after we did this, the uh, salting and the smoking and then the packaging, I took those down to um, Springfield and then uh, we, mo we moved them back to, they moved them out to uh, Haiti uh, shortly thereafter. Okay, so our next question is uh, from Pat. So, so what's the likelihood of removing Asian carp completely from the US waterways? Um, were that to happen, what would become of Asian carp as a potential food source as we see it now? So in other words, are we going to, is there going to be a problem about fishing it out of the waterways? And if so, then it could pre create some type of false market where the bottom drops out. So maybe uh, uh, Quentin, could you address that? You know, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and so, I, and I, I truly don't know how to answer that question. And, and I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are other folks on here. Um, so I will say this, uh, how I've always answered this question. And this is a, this is a great, this is a great question. Um, I, I think that the solution is, is that first let's deal with the problem that we have, get the population under control and then worry about that issue in, in the future. Because as it is right now, we're certainly not controlling the population, at least to a point where we're not seeing those negative effects on our on our aquatic systems. At least in at least in the Mississippi River proper, um, that's the only area that I can speak to on that. Now, uh, are there reduction programs in other areas? Absolutely. I don't. I can't speak to. Uh, how those populations are being influenced under the uh, under you know commercial harvest pressure. I know that they're the commercial guys are doing a wonderful job. They're doing as much as they can, uh, but as <clears throat> as Clint or, or or Roy could attest, um, there's a lot of time and, and money invested into this, um, and only being you know <clears throat> very few cents on the dollar to uh, go out there and harvest them. We need to have we need to have more incentive for uh, the commercial fishers to be able to go out there and do it. 
Do I think that there's going to be a hatchery facilities that are going to open up tomorrow because, uh, because we over harvested the, the car population? No. And, and then my secondary uh, sort of comment to that is that once we get to that point, um, and we remove the biomass uh, of Asian carp that aren't supposed to be there, then let's take those markets that are developed and utilize our native species in a sustainable way to allow the markets that were developed for Asian carp specifically to be switched over to something that's, that's more sustainable. <clears throat> Good. Great Thanks, question man. though. Great. Yeah. That was a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the next question is, um, my understanding is that USAID is not interested in supporting direct food product solutions uh, in place of subsidized money. Are, are there any political initiatives to, to uh, change the management agencies, uh, kind of perceptions on organizational authorities, uh, use uh, inland wild fisheries? Uh, maybe, um, Brady, if you could address at least part of that question about USAID, uh, you might be in a best, better position to, to make a comment about that. Uh, Un unmute, Brady. Yeah, unmute, unmute. yeah, right. Oh, my, my apologies. Uh, Mark, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure that I can effectively uh, interpret all of USAID policies. Uh, the agency, of course, is trying to fulfill American policies toward development needs abroad and food needs and the need for protein and balanced diets has taken the ascendancy over the last few years. And I've worked closely in advising USAID with uh, BIFAD for the past 10 years. My term has just come to an end there, by the way. Uh, but I enjoyed it very much. And a lot's going to depend on what American people think about the issues because they inform their legislators and the legislature then informs the USAID. Uh, so there may be policies in place that are restrictive. I, di I didn't fully grasp, I think, the significance of the, of the question. So I, if there's any specific part of that you want to repeat, please do so. But I think it's important to realize that USAID is trying to carry out what American taxpayers feel ought to be done to improve the lot of, of people who have food needs around the world. And so those policies can change over time. And, and the public education that can be undertaken by a group like we have tonight with the panel and your team uh, whom I commend very much for the uh, very impressive work you're doing, and particularly in Haiti. I've been in Haiti many times, and anyone who has realizes the primacy of just getting food has to take precedent over just about anything else at this time, and that's been true for some time. It's a country that really needs support. Uh, so I just hope we can keep people educated, keep looking at innovations, and then keep our public officials informed about the appropriate policies that USAID ought to be supporting in different parts of the world. Okay, good, thank you. Even though it's not mentioned in the question specifically, Brady, could you talk about the World Food Program and how they may differ, uh, be similar or differ from USAID and some of their uh, strategies and practices? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, the World Food Program is an agency of the United Nations, of course, and uh, a significant amount of their support comes from the United States, but it also comes from other countries around the world. So the World Food Program can be uh, uh, much more, I would say, pluralistic and definitely follow and not try, not having to be pressured by some of the, the uh, interests that the United States may be. So USAID is following the foreign policy initiatives of the United States as, as best they can be interpreted the World Food Program is looking much more broadly, much more generally at global food needs and drawing on the strength of countries around the world to help support those. So there's definitely a difference. They cooperate very well in the field, uh, but there are different forces driving them. And those, again, those change from time to time. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Okay, good. Let's move to the next question. Um, we want to try to 
address as many questions as we can. And even though we may not address any one, one fully question, a full question, at least we can uh, talk about some various parts of it. Uh, Dennis asked, uh, have you discussed the practical aspects of catching Asian carp with uh, commercial fishermen? And, uh, and Clint did before he, um, before he left um, or before he dropped, he talked a little bit about that himself. And so I think that that one has pretty much been addressed. Let's move to the next one here. Fred says, um, are there different, uh, oh, there are different people on the panel, each in an area of different uh, concentrations, uh, possible po profit points. Uh, what are examples of, of how someone could enter into the economic cycle? Um, maybe Roy, if you could answer that because you're the business person uh, uh, or at least a business person on the team, um, the one that we have designated for this particular role, uh, how could somebody enter into the economic cycle? As it stands right now, um, there is a lot of opportunity with these Asian carp. The biggest issue is there's very little government support with that. It has to be at your own dollar. Um, you basically have to invest your own money to get this program started. Um, and then there's the issue of commercial fishermen. There's a limited number out there. So even though there is a, what I'm considering a huge economic uh, benefit and environmental in, uh, benefit to this program, it's, you have to have the financial wherewithal to be able to do it without support from government agencies right now, uh, which is unfortunate. But, uh, you know, and that hopefully will change in the future and make it much easier to do something about this invasive species. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, so Karuba asked, um, and I guess this is for me, he says, when did the idea spark to, uh, uh, to convert Asian carp to feed the malnourished people in Haiti? Uh, so in other words, what inspired you to do so? Well, actually, uh, I've been working with the Asian carp for nearly a decade, and my first realm, uh, first kind of trial period was just feeding Missourians, and we were very successful about doing that. We had, um, I, I participated in a lot of Bass Pro events during the summers, and so they asked me to come and uh, supply a Asian carp to, to the guests or the attendees, and uh, so it's always a lot of fun. I love to see people... Uh, try to well, eat carp for the first time. So that's good. But then I kind of moved from that into more of a other realm, like, well, maybe we should be doing something different with this rather than just feeding Missourians. And so I had a connection in Haiti at the time, and it just started to dawn on me, like maybe if we uh, prepared these fish in a different way, a special way uh, that in fact, we could process them where they didn't need refrigeration freezing. And so this epiphany just occurred to me once I met this person from Haiti. He invited me to come down. We had the fish ready. And when I, when I saw this, it was really a life-changing experience for me because uh, actually one of the most profound things that I've done in my academic career. Um, it's it just incredible because of the, uh, the, the, the impact that one person can make on something like this. Now we didn't, we only took a few hundred pounds of fish down to Haiti. So it's not like a huge impact. But yet the, the, the spark, the genesis was there for this particular idea. And then it just uh, continued to grow. So I have kind of some uh, other plans in mind as we move through this process. So there's a, one answer for that one. Um, uh, what, are, what are some of the off the wall ideas that may have been considered to slow down the reproduction of carp? Um, I think one of those off the wall ideas was uh, Australia's um, either has or is in the process of experimenting with a carp herpes virus, herpes virus and uh, that to release that into the waterways in order to attack the carp in order to kill them. So that's probably one of the largest off the wall ideas that I have known about. Uh, Quentin, have you got any other ideas on this one? You know, uh, Mark, I, I, I have, I've heard of several of them. And I think the one that I hear most predominantly and, and not saying that this works or doesn't work, but, you know, sterilization um, or then, or then stocking individuals. And, and again, we're talking about off the wall ideas. 
um, creating some sort of sterilization process or stocking sterile fish back into the system. Um, it, anyway, um, I, I'm not going to degrade those thoughts or ideas, but in my opinion, those are, those are very lofty. <laughs> lofty is a good way to describe it. <laughs> what, are the, uh, what are the differences, uh, if any, between Asian carp caught in Missouri River uh, in the United States versus those in Europe or Asia? in terms of size or nutritional profile or things of that nature. Uh, Quentin, are there any real differences between our carp versus where they came from? Well, no, I, no, I don't. I mean, not any, at least from, at least from my, my colleagues in, in China, I think that, you know, we're talking about, you know, we're talking about the same exact species. Um, I think the one benefit that we have um, is that the size structure or the size of the of the carp that we have in our or in our large rivers is of course larger. Um, but I don't think that there's any differences in nutritional profile, um, et cetera. And and there could be there could be potentially less contaminants um, uh, in the U.S. systems. Uh, since we mentioned uh, the nutrition profile, um, Quentin, you just uh, co-authored a study about nutrition profiles. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the findings associated with that study in terms so, of macro and micronutrients? Right. So, uh, you know, that's the that's the beauty of of Asian carp is that you know vitamins, minerals, um, very good for heart health. Uh, omega threes, omega sixes, um, again, wonderful protein source. Um, and again, even though I, I stated as this, this prior, um, you know, we are this protein source uh, high in omega threes, high in omega sixes. And then because of, because, of, because of, uh, where it's what it's eating within the food web and because of how fast it grows the bioaccumulation of of heavy metals toxins etc uh, is going to be low so it this is this is a this is a quality protein source and you know i think it's good regardless if you're in the u.s or haiti or, or wherever it's something that humans should be consuming okay good Okay, uh, the next question is, um, uh, is there any governmental or quasi-governmental channels that could be considered available for, uh, for startups? Uh, I'm not sure specifically about that, and I don't know, is that, that's really open for anybody. Any, any thoughts on that question? I can step in and say that at this point, there's, there's potential out there, just nothing currently available um, on a um, right now basis. There's been talk, but it's very difficult to get into the arena mm -hmm. for those funds. Mark, Mark or Al, they may, Roy may have an answer, but would the general programs of the Small Business Administration be applicable? I would think maybe they would be for new startups. There are some for that. Um, it's just difficult right now with the uh, focus on the pandemic to tap into any of those resources. Um, they're not, they're really more available to help existing businesses survive as opposed to startups on new companies. I would say by the end of this calendar year, that may be more correct, but right now it's difficult to find those funds. Okay, uh, the next question is uh, what, um, or would this process, would this whole process be mostly led by private companies uh, in terms of harvest and removal, or are you hoping to get government agencies um, into, involved in, in uh, this particular practice, such as electrofishing uh, to help collect the fish? Um, I think I can answer a little bit of that, but Roy, I want you to chime in as well. If Clint came back, he might have some uh, opinions on this as well. Um, uh, the, the initiative needs to be really led by private companies because there's always money involved and uh, there's economic incentives that could be provided by the government, but the government is uh, typically not going to be out there doing the fishing. It's going to be private commercial fishers that are going to be doing this. So I'm very pro-private company 
um, to uh, at least spearhead this effort. Now they could be assisted by subsidies or something like that with the government, but um, that would be my take on this. Roy, do you have any thoughts? No, I, I agree with that, uh, that exact comment that you said. Um, it has to be led by private companies or maybe some governmental assistance. Um, and they are currently doing uh, that electrotype fishing in certain areas um, of the Illinois River that they've designated as um, uh, what I call it, biomass centers where they're trying to evaluate uh, the amount of fish that are actually being pulled out of the river. Are we making a dent in the population or is it increasing? Okay, good. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay, we're going to have to move on because we've got uh, several questions and we have about um, uh, a little less than 15 minutes in order to finish the program. We will finish at eight. And so I'm going to be skipping over some of the questions. I'm sorry, I just can't get to everyone. If we've answered something like this before that I won't answer it again. So uh, the new, a new question would be, is, is there a pet food market? So I think Roy, you've uh, talked with some of the folks um, recently about the potential for a pet food market. Is that right? Yes, we actually have several samples out right now to different pet food markets um, that are interested in this product because of the uh, quality protein it is and also the fact that it's sustainable, unfortunately, um, at this point, um, but it also in the fact that it's helping the environment. So a lot of pet food companies are looking towards that. Um, what can they do to help the environment at the same time feed uh, uh, their pet or someone else's pet with a quality product? And I've had a couple of pet food con companies contact me as well, but of course I don't deal specifically with carp, so not in a commercial aspect. Okay, so the next question is, um, how is this project being funded uh, from sampling costs to preservation and parking cost and shipment cost? Um, well, that would be for me. Uh, and actually that brings up one of the points that I wanna make tonight. It is a fundraising effort that I'm involved with. And so I would strongly encourage you to uh, take a look at the other information that's provided on the website that you initially logged into. And uh, there is a donor uh, spot there. And I would be very happy and very appreciative of the fact of uh, any donations for, for tonight, because it is, I mean, it's not largely, it, it, well, it's not completely self-funded. I have gotten some grants before, but right now it's very small funds. So I've gotten a couple of uh, startup funds from the from MU. So we're talking, you know, like five thousand dollars here, ten thousand dollars there, you know, that type of thing. But I'm going to need a little bit bigger money. And then what I'd like to do is conduct some more tests. So really, it's it's really part of the focus for tonight is a fundraising effort. So yes, I have received some funds, uh, but certainly not enough. Okay, so let's go with the next question. Uh, do you think that people in America could be less averse to eating carb if they see that it's the hunger reducing effects worldwide? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, Brady, what do you think about this? Um, uh, do you think the people in America would be less averse to eating carb if they, uh, if they see it's a hunger reducing strategy or effect worldwide? Hmm. You know, uh, that, that's a very interesting question and uh, in an observation, uh, I, think, I think that's actually true, that the more that we see foods eaten around the world, the more we're likely to participate in that eating process. And I'll tell you why I say that. And that is, you can see there's a growing surge in, uh, in ethnic restaurants around the, in every part of the world and in cookbooks and, and recipes that draw on different, uh, you know, different ethnic groups and compositions. And you'll have people submitting recipes from different backgrounds. And so we're experimenting a lot more with food because we, we learn to understand the particular taste and delicacy that other people have. So, Australia, you know, some people would be surprised, I think, by that. But my observation, it's just my judgment, is that it definitely would have an effect. We see people around the world somewhere eating that, we will try it out and then it'll slowly make its way into uh, some diets here in this country as well. Uh, Kevin, what do you think about that? Uh, since you deal a lot with domestic uh, hunger programs as well as global programs, uh, what's your thought on this one? 
No, I agree with what Brady said. I think that there's an element that uh, there is a desire uh, for more international flair and, and international things. So I think that it can be shown that, hey, carp is a widely consumed product all around the world. I think that it could help with that. I think at the end of the day, you just have to get more publicity out there that, you know, I, I think that people don't understand that it's flaky. It, it's very uh, it actually, they would probably be surprised, and I've tried it, of course, be surprised how similar and kind of familiar it is to other things they eat. So I think it's completely possible. It just needs some of the right people to continue to get behind it. Good. Thank you. Yeah, I agree, too. Okay, so we have another question from Fred. It says, um, I fish I fished for many years and have grown up um, with uh, being told that carp are full of bones. And... Um, um, and thus uh, hard to eat because of all the bones. Is there a secret process or do you uh, catch very large fish and cut or fillet them, uh, cut or fillet the bones out of them? Um, Quentin, I think you've done a little bit of work with this. And then um, I think Roy, you probably could answer this one as well too. So, and Roy uh, uh, certainly uh, stopped me um, or, or add to, um, you know, you know, this is, this is a, this is a big issue. At least when carp first came on the scene, it was like, well, you know, we have this overabundance of a, a highly invasive species that's, that's wreaking havoc on, you know, native fishes. Um, but the problem is, is that there's pin bone, pin bones, uh, throughout the entire, in, in, throughout the entire fillet. And, and the fact of the matter is, is that <clears throat> we have developed methods, uh, to be able to fillet this fish boneless. Um, and, and just for the, you know, the, the typical angler, and I'm not talking from a rec or a commercial side, uh, the commercial standpoint, but the, the typical recreational angler, with just a little bit of practice, um, can fillet this fish to a boneless, uh, to a boneless fillet. And, and is that it's actually really not, not that hard to do, uh, in coordination with Mark, you know, several years ago, uh, we did, you know, several videos on, on how to fillet the Asian carp boneless. Uh, we did some stuff with the, with Andrew Zimmern from Bazaar Foods, and then uh, work with the folks at, at Bass Pro Shops uh, numerous times and, and, and had some informational videos posted to YouTube uh, about how to fillet these. I'm sure that uh, I'm sure that Roy has maybe some more insight. Uh, but one last plug I will add is that uh, um, in the event that you can get these uh, individuals to a point where they're consumable, uh, the human market is, is a good one, uh, because it keeps that price point up. Um, I, you know, someone asked about, you know, food, food consumption for pets. Um, and, and I think that that's a, that's a fine thing, but, you know, humans, uh, humans should be consuming this, uh, this flesh because it does, it does well for our entire economy continues to build up the commercial fishing, uh, the commercial fishers, uh, their, their benefit for the economy. Um, and, and, and as my dad said, which is a uh, culinary of uh, culinary Institute of America, a chef trained chef, he said that, uh, this is one of the best fish products that you can get for Americans because, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't have those, uh, typical fish that typical fish taste fish uh people in america want a fish that tastes like chicken and and this is it thank you uh, roy uh could you quickly just add a little bit to that i know that there's machinery available uh quentin talked about hand filleting the fish which can be done but it's a little bit of a tedious process um could you mention just a little bit about um the machinery involved in this sure um and i do agree that the hand filleting is a, a process the difference is the yield on a fish like that and the time it takes is about eight to 10% on a yield for a filet. Um, whereas the process we use is we mince this product um, in a mincing machine that actually separates the bone from the flesh and your yield is about 30 to 35%. Um, it comes out like a ground turkey, if you wanna call it that, it looks like ground hamburger, um, but it's a very good quality product. And that's what we're, that's what we're focusing on right now for that human consumption aspect. Okay, good, good. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. 
Okay, we're almost out of time. I only got just a, a couple of minutes left, so we won't be able to get to the last question. So I apologize for that because I did want to talk a little bit about well, I had a couple other things that I want to close out with, and then also invite you to stay on. Uh, the attend the panelists can leave, of course. They could stay if they wanted to, but uh, I will will officially end the webinar at eight o'clock. Uh, but if anybody, I'll stay on for a little bit, and if anybody wants to to chat with me, uh, I'll be more than happy to talk with them about it. Uh, and then panelists, you can decide what you'd like to do. Um, so here's a couple of questions that I've been asked about the project, and that is, you know, what is my overall goal for the project? And and I'd like to just quickly address this. Uh, really, it's it's a matter of addressing the carp population. It's a problem, an environmental issue that we have, but we're not solving the problem. We're just addressing the problem. And then the same thing goes with uh, malnutrition or world hunger. Uh, we're, we're just simply addressing this. Uh, we can only do so much um, with the, the resources that we have. So my goal is certainly not to eliminate the carp population, nor to uh, eradicate world hunger or malnutrition. So that's my overall goal is just to address it. Uh, and then another question I've been asked is, uh, how does it feel knowing that, um, that your research could possibly impact people in developing countries worldwide? And, uh, and I can say it's just an overwhelming feeling. Like I've mentioned before, it's probably the most uh, beneficial thing in my entire academic career that I've been involved with, where I've come up with an idea and then seen that through into fruition and then um, been able to uh, see the, the benefits of that, uh, especially expressed in the lives uh, and the faces of children in, uh, in developing countries such as, uh, such as Haiti. And then uh, the last question that I'm often asked, and I'll just make a quick note about this again in case you came on late. So what do you need in order to uh, accomplish your objectives? Um, well, I need information. We need information out there. We certainly need awareness. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but like I mentioned before, it is a fundraising type event. So if you're inclined to donate, uh, tonight would be a great time to do that. Certainly open for donations, regardless of what it is, whether it's a small donation, a medium, a large donation, it doesn't really make any difference because every dollar that's gained through this particular process means that we can uh, remove uh, a little bit more of the carp population and that we can address a little bit more of the world malnutrition problem and so therefore, any contribution is going to be helpful and worthy and beneficial. So I certainly would appreciate that. So with that, I think that uh, it's getting close to eight o'clock. Uh, like I mentioned, I'll be glad to stay on for a few minutes. Uh, if anybody wants to continue the conversation, uh, we'll be glad to do that. But I have an agreement with my uh, web, uh, webinar producers from MU to close it uh, at eight o'clock. And so that's what I, well, what I intend to do. So thank you very much. Appreciate your attendance.